Hello, everybody. Uh, I don't do this with a mic very often, so it may take me a minute to get used to it. <clears throat> so, um, just before we get going, we, I used to give this talk a lot for the last few years about what our plane was going to be like and how we were building it, and now we've actually flown it a couple of times. And uh, so I just wanted to show a few pictures of our very first flight back in December in Half Moon Bay. Um, I'm going to go over the motivation for the project, a brief history of human-powered airplanes, or HPAs. Uh, we're going to go over design considerations, materials, specifications. I'll show some highlights and video from the first flight, and then we'll go into construction details. Uh, we'll do Q&A at the end. I'm going to have a lot of material to get through, so try to hold your questions unless there's a really urgent question or something, um, and we'll, we'll save those for the end. And before I go over the construction details, I'm going to pass around a lot of these things uh, to, so that you can look at them while I'm showing slides of the construction and talking about it. Uh, I already passed around four sets of photographs that are laminated. Uh, we made up for Maker Fair a few weeks ago. It shows some of the flight photos and a lot of photos of, of different construction processes. So if you pass those around, you can take a look at those as well. So why did we do this? Um, it was basically just for the fun of it. Uh, I, at the time, I was working at Google and had started this thing called the Google Workshops. And we just moved into a new building. I wanted to do a, a cool project. And I saw a video of the Snowbird Ornithopter human-powered airplane. And that kind of reminded me that I really wanted to fly a human-powered airplane sometime in my life. And so I just wanted to have fun designing and building. It was no real practical purpose. Um, Going back a little bit, back in high school, around the time that uh, the Gossamer Condor won the Kramer Prize, um, I found this book that was one of the first, I knew I wanted to be an engineer, but it was one of the first books that um, I opened it up and I could see, hey, there's these equations that aren't that difficult, and I could see myself <coughs> designing something like this. And as I said, at about the same time, the Gossamer Condor won the Kramer Prize. I'll go over what that that was in just a second. And then I went to go work, uh, as you just mentioned, at Air Environment on the, the EV1 electric car, which is sort of the grandfather of all the cars that are out there now, the Tesla, the Leaf. And, and while we were working on that, hanging over our head in Air Environment's Simi Valley facility was this, this uh, airplane, which was um, the uh, Speed Prize, Kramer Speed Prize uh, airplane called the Bionic Bat. And um, uh, so we were, we were working these 12, 14, 16 hours a day trying to get this car ready for the LA Auto Show. But we were always looking up. It was building very much like this. And it's hanging from the ceiling. And we're looking up saying, we ought to take that down some weekend and go out and fly it. But we never had time to do it. So I'm going to go over all this. You don't have to read this slide, but just talk about the history of, of human-powered flight. Um, just a second. Bag. There's a laser pointer in the side pocket. So people have been thinking about human-powered flight for a long time. Uh, this is at the National Air and Space Museum, a model of one of Leonardo da Vinci's <coughs> ideas. It's probably using the wrong muscles, and the wingspan is way too short. But it gives you an idea that people were, have been thinking about it for quite quite a while. The first, thank you very much. The first. Um, uh, sort of competition that spurred on human-powered flight was called the Peugeot Prize in early 1900s. And all they had to do was basically make a hop of 10 meters and they would win, I think it was 5,000 francs, which is actually worth quite a lot in today's dollars. It's like $50,000 or something. So you got a lot of vehicles like this that had, um, basically it was a bicycle with some wings attached to it and a tail the wings are at zero degree angle of attack. They have some sort of spring mechanism in there. The guy rides really, really fast, hits a button, and the thing pops into the air totally out of control, and then he hopes that he goes 10 meters. <laughs> and it actually took somebody about 15 years to win the, the prize. This wasn't the prize winning one, but it's just a good photo of showing you know, what they looked like at the time. <clears throat> then jump forward into the late 50s. Um, Henry Kramer, a British industrialist who was interested in fitness and flight, uh, wanted to spur on human-powered airplanes. 
and he teamed up with the Royal Aeronautics Society and came up with a course that you would have to complete to win. First it was a 5,000 pound prize for British subjects only and then it continually got increased until it was 50,000 pounds, which is about $250,000 in today's dollars um, uh, prize for anybody in the, in the world. And you had to do a figure eight around two uh, markers that were spaced a half mile apart. So a little bit more than a mile in the air since you have the space for the turns. And at the start and the end, you had to be 10 feet above the ground and then you had to not touch the ground anywhere in between. The idea behind the figure eight was to make sure that you actually had controlled flight. The reason the Wright brothers were the real inventors of flight is they figured out the control problem. It's pretty easy to do some uncontrolled hop but uh, this would prove that you really had control. And so that immediately spurred on um, a bunch of people to try to start making things. And just two years later, the very first human powered airplane that took on, on off under its own power um, was built and flown, some pack from Southampton University. And the, the other people were building airplanes. This one is Jupiter, which didn't fly until uh, almost 10 years later. Um, but the reason I'm showing this slide is how intricate this was. It was all the designs back then were based on um, sailplane, wooden sailplane designs of the you know 30s and stuff, and it's very very intricate. Lots, many many hours of work going into building these ribs, and then if you have any sort of accident, you have hundreds or thousands of hours to, to fix it again. This airplane actually was the first airplane to fly a kilometer long flight. And this is a picture of Jupiter on its one kilometer long flight. And we're going to see a video now of both of those airplanes. This is some made the first human powered takeoff in 1960. Notice how all the planes back then had this drive wheel. In 1962. They thought that they needed that to accelerate. 993 yards. And the record stood for 10 years. For, for takeoff, it turns out it was just a big waste of it was beaten power in 1972 and weight. 1972 by Jupiter. A heavier but aerodynamically cleaner design, piloted by a strong athlete. But it couldn't turn very well. Control has always been a problem for HPAs because they fly so slowly. And Jupiter was no exception. <laughs> so the reason I like to show that is, um, you know, that relatively minor looking crash probably took weeks or months to fix because of how intricate the, the plane itself, the construction of the plane itself was, as I showed in that previous slide. Um, so I'm just going to show a few more pictures quickly of some of these airplanes. This is Puffin flying. This is the Dumbo. You notice how, how wobbly these wings look. All of these airplanes, in order to work, have to be sort of around the weight of 100 pounds or less. And they have huge wingspans. This was a two-person uh, airplane that actually built, was built and flown called Toucan. This was an attempt at a ground effect airplane. The idea was you would pedal really hard, pop up for the 10 feet, and then go right back down and just be a few inches above the ground. But it didn't fly very well. Uh, Taurus Kucinic, who designed it, ended up working on the Gossamer Condor project. There was a series of airplanes in Japan that were built out of like wood and rice paper that actually were pretty successful. And then they had built one called the Stork that was an awful lot like the Jupiter, and this was the first airplane to fly over a mile, which is the length you need to go for the Kramer Prize. Um, <clears throat> and it also did some 180 degree turns, but it didn't link them all together and win. Well, back in California, Paul McCready, who some of you may have heard of, he was the uh, 
national and international soaring champ several several times. He invented this thing called the McCready speed ring that tells you how fast you have to fly uh, optimally between thermals and a sailplane. And he had been involved in the NASA hang glider field uh, back in the mid 70s, and he knew about this prize, and he also had lost fifty thousand dollars to a relative that he was never going to get back. And so he thought, wait, if I win this prize, if I just put something together really quickly, I'll make all my money back. And um, he realized that if he took the dimensions of a hang glider and increased them three times, that would bring the power a hang glider takes, which is about a, of the day, it was about a horsepower, down to about a third of a horsepower, which is something a human can put out for about five or ten minutes, which is the time you need to complete this course. He made a radically different design from all those sailplane looking airplanes. Uh, it's a canard, it's heavily wire braced. I don't know how well you can see that with the lighting here, but there's just wires everywhere. Most of the Lift load is taken up from wires. Here's another picture of it. The first version just had a single surface and a few ribs and a whole bunch of wires and it flew from the very start. It only took him a couple weeks to build. He thought they would win the whole prize in six weeks and in the end it took about a year. But the real secret here was they could, in the end when they won it, it was quite highly modified. It was double surface. They put a fairing around the pilot. Um, the real secret was they flew over once a day. They flew about 400 times in the one year it took to win the prize. Compared to those other airplanes you saw probably flew a half a dozen or a dozen times in their entire lifetime. They would crash, the thing would crumple, and they would take it back to the hangar and have it fixed the same day or early, early the next day. And so they got to iterate massively. They had a lot of um, issues with trying to figure out how to make the thing turn. It's so big and so massive, had so much more wing area than the other planes. The way they got away with the, all these wires is this thing was flying at 10 miles an hour and all the other airplanes are flying at 15 or 20. If you remember, the drag goes up with the cube of speed. So the drag on those wires was actually a small enough fraction of the overall drag that could make it work. But that weird, very slow flight flying regime with very light wing loading turned very strangely and they had to actually use the ailerons to skid themselves around the turn in an opposite bank instead of the normal way of turning. So I'm going to show a little video of that. So you can see it's a pretty unusual looking plane. <laughs> I think this was a video taken of a degrading film, which is why it's so pink looking. But um, this actually, the, the short film is about a 25 minute film, won the Oscar for uh, Best Documentary Short this year. I'm not going to show too much because we don't have a lot of time, but just want to give you a sense of that. And so then Kramer, so they won the prize. It, they, it took about ten tries. Um, it's a big deal. McCready was named the Engineer of the Century because of it by SAE or something like one of the engineering um, groups, and. Kramer and the Royal Aeronautics Society decided, okay, well, that was really cool. How can we further advance this human powered flight thing? Let's make something that's going to take another 15 years or so to win. They won the prize about 17 years after it was started. And so they made a much harder challenge, which is to fly all the way across the English Channel. But these guys just kept building airplanes. They got really good at it. They switched to carbon fiber for the spars, which let them get rid of about half of the lift wires because the spar itself was stronger and they cleaned up the wing a little bit and so they could fly a few miles an hour faster so it wouldn't take quite as long. They got a more efficient propeller and within two years on the very first attempt they crossed English Channel and won a hundred thousand pound prize which is about a half a million dollars in today's dollars. Um, this is a picture of the plane uh, finishing 
in France on the beach a few minutes after this was taken and he actually landed. Somebody came up and held one of the wires and, and broke the spar. Give you an idea of how fragile these things are. So then Kramer did a speed prize to try to get some more practical human powered airplane going. I don't know how practical they are. Um, we, we've got some experience with this. Uh, it's, a, it's an awful lot of work. But uh, the idea here was that you could store energy for five or ten minutes on, pedaling on the ground and then use that plus the combined uh, power of the human to go around, I think it was a triangular course. And so McCready had this bionic bat, which is the one I talked about earlier, that was hanging over her head working on the electric car. And they thought they won the prize, but they'd done their energy storage wrong. So then MIT won the prize, and I'm missing that slide. And then they went back and forth. If you broke the prize by uh, speed by like 5%, you win another prize. So they went back and forth several times. And then this guy in Germany built a completely human-powered airplane that was faster than the ones that had stored energy for five minutes and won the prize. This is actually his, um, his brother, who is the pilot, taking his sister in what's supposed to be a one-person human-powered airplane. So then the guys from MIT that did the, the speed prize plane, they wanted to build the ultimate human-powered airplane. So they made their own challenge. It wasn't a prize, but it was just something that they wanted to do. And they, um, they got sponsorship from United Technologies, and I think the, for the prototype from, from Michelob. And uh, they designed a course to recreate the mythical flight of Daedalus and Icarus from Crete to Greece. So um, over 70 miles. And they built three airplanes, a prototype and two competition airplanes. And they trained five riders in a, that were constantly having one person trained up. They did a bunch of testing in the desert. This is a picture of that. And then they went and flew in Greece, and they had to wait about a, a month for good weather. But then on the first attempt, they had a successful 115-kilometer um, flight. At the end of the flight, they had a lot of wind on the island of Santorini when they were trying to land on the beach. And as they tried to turn into the wind, the tail boom and the wing broke and the whole thing fell into the water about 15 feet off the beach, so they sort of recreated the flight of both Daedalus and Icarus in the same way. <laughs> I, mean, I don't have a picture of that, but it looked something like this. Uh, so these days, a lot of the human-powered airplane action happens at this thing called the Birdman Rally in Japan. And they take off in this 10-meter ramp, which is uh, pretty dramatic, um, over this lake called Lake Biwa, which is in the center of the main island, Honshu, in Japan. It's about maybe two and a half times as big as Lake Tahoe, to give you an idea. It's about uh, 20 plus kilometers across. The year I went and took these photos, the winter went 22 kilometers. They went almost all the way to the other side of the, the lake. Um, and the really sad thing is they always end up landing in the water, and even if the plane's completely intact, this guy comes along with a jet ski and clamps, holds on to the tail boom, and then drags the airplane back through the water to the shore. So by the time it gets back to the shore, it looks like this sad mess there. And then the other thing that's been going on in human powered flight is the Sikorsky Prize, which was outstanding for about 30 years. Uh, it sounds like it's a lot easier than what these human powered airplanes do. The, the prize was to be hover up to 10 feet uh, for some part of the, the flight, and hover for one minute inside a 30 foot by 30 foot box, which sounds easy, but the analogy I like to use is flying an airplane is kind of like walking up a gentle ramp, um, and flying a helicopter, human powered helicopter, is like being in the gym and you know, climbing up one of those ropes going straight up. You're, you're basically flying in your own wake, so you're recirculating your own wake, and it takes a lot of energy. And for a long time, the record was just a few seconds and a few inches above the ground, and then a team in Maryland, and this team in Canada built these really large quadcopters, which are sort of stable because their quadcopters are relatively stable. And they started going many feet up and staying up many seconds. And it was a real race to see who would win. And these guys who had a bigger rotor area, so less power, eventually won. So I'm going to show you a short video of that. Maybe I won't be showing you a short video. The 
the way this works is they know that they have to fly for a minute, so they have about a minute and five seconds worth of Kevlar cord going out to each of the um, helicopter rotors, and it spools up on four spools attached to here. You'll see a better shot of that later. The bottom of each one of those is where the, wire, the cord is coming out of. If you look this up on YouTube, there's some really good uh, video of some crashes that they had. It's kind of kind of scary crashes where it broke when he was up really high. These, are, in order to make this work at all, it had to be very, very on the edge. You know, designed for like 1.05 G. I think the whole thing weighed about 60 or 70 pounds. Which is pretty amazing. There you can see the spools, the four spools. He's leaning because there's a small amount of control that he can have and he's getting close to the edge of the square. So that helps him move back a little bit. That was pretty cool. Um, okay. So there are there are some, there are some prizes outstanding for human powered airplanes now, but they're pretty unrealistically hard. There's one to do a what's called a marathon course, which is a marathon distance in an hour. And if you just do the math, it's not really doable, at least not by a single uh, pilot human powered airplane. And then there's another one for building a sporting aircraft. I wish I wasn't competing with the aircraft outside right now. Um, that has to average about 22 miles an hour over a two mile course and you have to be able to assemble it and then disassemble it in a half an hour each time. Um, but we weren't going for anything like that, we just wanted to build something for fun. So I needed to decide, you know, what kind of human powered airplane are we going to build? And the constraints I set for myself were to have a low design and build time, make it easy to take out to the field. This is something I wanted to build and then be able to go have fun flying. Uh, I wanted to have a 2.5 G structural limit for the wing. Um, Daedalus was built to 1.75 G's and it broke in the end. Um, most of this, you're never going to see 2.5 G's in the air in a human powered airplane because you bank only a couple degrees. <clears throat> you might see some gusts and stuff, but mostly this is for if you hit a wing tip on the ground, you don't want to get very much damage. And then um, have some other limitations here, but basically I wanted it to cost the same or less than a moderately, moderately expensive luxury car, and I came to call this my Tesla, because instead of buying a Tesla, I paid for this. It ended up being about uh, my garage full of Teslas in the end, uh, two Teslas. Um, it's all volunteer labor, and um, we tried to you know, keep things pretty simple. Um, boy, this is a big slide. Uh, I'll just hit a couple points here. Um, we wanted to basically use simple aerodynamics. You don't need to do anything very difficult. You don't have to do panel codes or anything complex like that for a human powered airplane. I designed it in all in metric because I wanted to do it that way. Um, and a big thing is that we built, built on previous human powered airplane successes. So we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel here. We, we learned, and, and the other thing is we got advice from a lot of HPA pioneers. So we, we contacted people, we, the Aerovelo guys that had built an airplane before that, um, people who had worked on Daedalus, a uh, team in, in Canada that had done an airplane called Pegas, and uh, the teams in Japan. So we got advice from lots and lots of people. We didn't do any of these fancy things because we didn't really need to. We didn't design a new airfoil, we just used the Daedalus airfoil since they were designed for an airplane like this. And we tried to keep it simple. We have a, you'll see in the picture I showed a minute, constant wing cord for most of the wings so we can just stamp out the same part over and over. Uh, we have a simple 90 degree twisted chain drive. Daedalus used a um, shaft drive because they didn't want to lose a chain in the middle of the GNC. But that was a big engineering effort, a lot harder than just twisting a chain. Um, we, Things like the rudder and, and elevate, uh, elevator, we just had constant core, again, so we could make it look a little bit simple. The challenges for a human-powered airplane is it's very low power. A human could put out about 200 or 300 watts continuously for long periods of time. 
put out maybe almost a kilowatt uh, if you're a really powerful pilot, but for very short bursts of five or 10 seconds. Um, a kilowatt, to give you an idea, that's what a hairdryer uses. So it's a very little amount of power. So in order to be able to fly in that low amount of power, you have to have very light weight. And um, in order to have take low power, you have to have very, very long wings so that you have low induced drag. Um, 